Okay. Um, nice to uh, be here today. Uh, I'm uh, Joran Backlund. I'm the CTO of Saab Dynamics, but I'm also uh, the chair of the Saab AM group, AM standing for additive manufacturing. And it's in that capacity I'm here today. And I'm gonna tell you a little about uh, yeah, that's me in a little more close up uh, uh, about additive manufacturing and what's happening at Saab. But I, I have the following disposition. Uh, I'm going to say a little about additive manufacturing in general uh, for those of you who might not be that familiar with the technology. And then I'm going to show you something about how Saab approached that this technology and, and some of our strategy. And I'll end by showing uh, some cases. And uh, uh, previous and ongoing cases at Saab. So starting with additive manufacturing, I have a 30 second um, uh, tutorial here on uh, what additive manufacturing it really is. So I'll start this and this is about a 3D printer that holds a building chamber. It's limited in three dimension. It's a box that you build in. So here it, what is what happens uh, in that building chamber. Um, you have, a, you work with metal powder and you fill the containers, not that way, but in principle, you fill the containers with metal. You spread it out very thin, like 20 microns. And then you have some energy source like electron beam or laser that actually melts uh, a section, uh, a profile of that uh, layer that you want to be a part of a component. And then you do this layer by layer, as you can see. And as you build, you lower the built component down. Uh, so at the end of the build, you have a built component in the chamber, but it's surrounded with powder that wasn't used. So you have to take it out. It sits on a build plate and you have to take it out and clean it and take away the powder. But then you can imagine you can build, a, uh, if you wanted a, a channel in that one, it's just leaving a hole in the profile and there will be a channel and it could be of any shape. So it, it gives a lot of design freedom. And this is what it looks like when you, when you look into a, a building chamber with a laser, it's pretty much the same technology. What you see here is a, Retarder, uh, it's a brake, uh, truck brake uh, um, with hydraulic brake for a truck. And it was built here with uh, st uh, steel. Um, it took some 80 hours to build it. It's a very tedious proce process when you look at it. But mind you, if you want to do this with a cast, for example, you need to develop tools and it takes you months instead of hours. So it's uh, in that perspective, it's a pretty fast technology. Now, uh, this, uh, is, this is what the machines, 3D printers, so to speak, uh, currently look like, at least to the left. Uh, the black one on the left is uh, from the former Swedish company, Arcam, which was acquired by GE, and now is part of it, GE Additive. Uh, it's an electron beam uh, machine you melt the powder with electron beam and it's a hot uh, building chamber. So you heat it up, you build it hot and you cool it down. And uh, at the end of the day, you have a stress-free part that you take out of that machine. Uh, the, the white machine next to it is a, a laser a variant, a selective laser melting from EOS, uh, biggest uh, printer provider in the world from uh, Germany. And that's a cold building chamber. It's same technology, you spread powder, you melt it with a laser, but you don't heat up the chamber. So there, there you have to make some stress relief of the parts before you uh, cut them from the plate. Um, it's uh, usually one laser uh, or four lasers that work in quadrants, but you have one machine to the right coming up that's pretty interesting from another German supplier called SLM. Uh, that's a, big, a fairly big building chamber, 600 by 600 by 600 millimeters. That's um, large in terms of uh, powder bed fusion, as we talk about here. But um, and this machine is not something that, that you have in your living room. You can see it. it it's a two-story machine. It has 12 lasers. Now you can imagine you can build pretty fast. 
but you have 12 one kilowatt lasers. Um, that's a fireplace, 12, kilo, 12 kilowatts. So this machine is pretty much about cooling, cooling systems, but it's uh, very um, fast, yes, high productivity. And that's one of the trends actually with 3D printing, increasing productivity. Uh, this is another technology I want to touch upon called uh, DED or directed energy deposition. You're not confined with a building chamber now. Uh, you have a robot, industrial robot that holds a uh, energy source, the laser, and you feed into the laser with powder or a wire. So uh, in the uh, bottom left, you can see you can add structure onto a um, existing one like this spiral added onto the rod here, the axis. Or to the upper right, you have uh, NASA and Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama that uh, use it to print uh, rocket nozzles. And uh, rocket nozzles that are too big for 3D printers with uh, limited chambers. That's uh, over one meter in diameter. And it has cooling channels in the walls as well. And the, there's another uh, exciting example that, at the bottom right, uh, and that was done in, in Holland uh, a couple of years ago. You see four industrial robots building a bridge and build as they move on. To, uh, so they built a bridge in a hangar and uh, from stainless steel, and they inaugurated it actually in July this year. Uh, by their queen, opened uh, and inaugurated this bridge. It's 12 meters long, stainless steel, printed as one component. It's equipped with a lot of sensors, so, so they're going to study it. It sits on, a, on one of the canals in, in Amsterdam. I'm going to be there one day. We'll take a look at it. Um, and of course, we also use uh, a lot of um, polymer printing, and they come in lots of different shapes. Uh, you can also work with polymers as powder, but here you have filaments. Um, and that's the most common, actually, um, 3D printer that people are in general uh, familiar with. Now, what are the values with this technology? Uh, it's mainly complexity. You can build things that were not possible to build before. Uh, you have an enormous design freedom. Uh, you're not limited so much as, as with the traditional techniques like uh, turning and milling. Um, and that's very exciting. You can build things you, that you couldn't build before. Uh, you can optimize from functions. If you don't have to compromise with the technology, you can uh, make it near ideal. For example, in a heat exchanger, uh, you can reduce weight. You don't um, use more powder than you need to build the component, actually. So it's the best way to actually optimize for weight. And you get shorter lead time. Um, you can put parts together that parts that were needed to be uh, separately manufactured and assembled can now be printed as one. Uh, I'll come to that. And, uh, and when you have found such a case, you also reduce cost. And uh, the interesting thing, you get it all at the same time, which is usually not the case. I'm going to return to the, this one uh, in a minute or so. So this is about the technology. So how do we take the value out of this at the sub uh, group? Um, well, we have um, organized ourselves uh, and sobbed to the right. There is from 1st of July, you have four different business areas and, and Combitech, the tech consultants business. And it's aeronautics uh, with the Gripen program mainly, surveillance, uh, radars, and dynamics, which I represent is uh, mostly weapon systems. And then you have COCOMs with uh, the submarines. And we have we got the mission from um, the, uh, the strategy council at group level, um, set up a group and do this uh, together because usually we work in our different stoves, stove pipes at Saab. And there's not much collaboration uh, uh, horizontally in the, in the picture here. But we did this with the AM technology. We set up a group and I have people in this group from all parts of Saab and uh, we have, uh, a task to uh, 
derive and update and use a sub AM strategy, which we have. Uh, we collaborate um, and disseminate our knowledge within the SOB group. We have an upcoming SOB AM day in November. Uh, and we also, uh, SOB co-owns a company uh, named Amexia, I'll come to that too. Uh, and we are the, um, the window to Amexia, uh, where we decide on which uh, cases we run with Amexia. So we try to use, utilize Amexia as much as possible. So, um the focus our strategy is uh i'll skip to the second uh, part here technology is powder bed fusion as i just showed you directed energy deposition and polymers so i'm going to show you examples of this and we have work groups uh, focusing on trying to solve, solve the challenges with how should we work what kind of softwares do we need um for uh, to AM for tools and fixtures. I have an example on that. Qualification is important. How do you prove that the parts are okay and the materials are okay? And we have a new procurement category team that helps us uh, with the supply chain. And the little uh, box to the right, you can see we have a little uh, AM in numbers. It's a contest, if you will. Uh, the best up until now, uh, part reduction from six, we have one case where we had 609 parts that was actually possible to build as one. I think that's a world record actually. Uh, and weight savings and lead time savings and things like that. And how many printers we have, we have polymer printers, we don't have metal printers at Saab yet, but um, because we work with Amexi. And we have about 10 parts. Now, it, that was 2020. We have more parts now in volume production using additive manufacturing. And this is our vision. We want to be a leader in our business using this technology and actually harvest the most value out of this technology as possible in our products and the supply chains. Some key achievements um, last year, we built a demonstrator, uh, I'll come to that. Um, and we had next uh, bullet is we had 28 different projects together with Amexity saying something about the volume of action at Saab on additive manufacturing. Um, we had the Saab AM day with 190 par participants. It was all digital uh, last year, of course. Uh, we have other demos uh, like in, in Dynamics as well. And um, I'll also show you a case where we actually flew with one of the 3D printed polymer parts in the Gripen Fighter last March. Uh, supply chain strategy is pretty important to Saab. Uh, this is a new technology and now we have the opportunity to do this together and do it the right way. Uh, so we try to establish um, uh, one supply chain for entire Saab where we pull together our different needs to suppliers. Um, we want to have competition between suppliers, but we also need to learn how, what kind of specs do we need to send to the suppliers when we want uh, quotations? Um, because this is a new technology and you have new design information that, that needs to be there. So it affects our way of working actually. Uh, I mentioned Amexi, and I would say that Amexi is now, uh, when it comes to metal additive manufacturing, is our um, uh, laboratory. The, the, it's our AM lab they build for us, and they are our R&D partner. Um, it was funded uh, by uh, all these companies except for Ericsson, because Ericsson joined this year. And it was actually our um, uh, chairman of the board, Marcus Wallenberg, was, uh, one, took the initiative to actually start this. And uh, the result was uh, that all these industries went in and they own Amexi equally in between them. And uh, this is the Amexi team. It's, over, it's about 20 people now in Koskoga. Um, and we have a very interesting lab there. They, uh, share some facilities with another company that actually comes um, down the chain, so to speak, when you have to, to finish your parts uh, using five axis machines. Hitab is uh, the company that does that. 
So they have a very modern lab. It's mostly glass and they have done this the right way. They have a separated materials that shouldn't be mixed and they have taken seriously the, um, the um, uh, health aspects, uh, as you can see, uh, because you, you need to realize that the small fractions of these powders are not good to be in contact with. So they have an uh, airlock where they clean their clothes before they take them off. And uh, when you work in the open machines and you have powder exposed in the, in the room, it looks like this. And it's glass because um, if something happens in these cells where you have the different machines, uh, should the, there be ga uh, gas, which the machines use be spread in the, you see if somebody is, uh, is ill and you can uh, help them actually. So they have now a lab with a lot of machinery, uh, metal printers up to the, to the left. They have actually more printers than what is here now. Um, they started with two metal um, printers from the US and one uh, experimental machine from Conity. Have a lot of polymer machines. They last year in, uh, inaugurated a materials lab where they can do some tensile testing and um, materials um, microstructure analysis. So um, they're becoming pretty well equipped. And actually they bought uh, last, uh, this year an SLM machine also for volume production. And um, that's how we work. We don't have metal printers uh, at sub facilities yet. We have a lot of polymer printers, but we use Amexi as our main R&D partner for metal printing. Now, what have we done? Uh, as it goes, the most exciting cases, I cannot tell you about. <laughs> Unfor unfortunately, it's, that's the case. But I have something I can show you. Um, we started um, a while ago in November uh, 2014. Uh, I actually was responsible for this case to get it going. Uh, we 3D printed the breach of the a uh, recoilless grenade rifle called Gustav. Uh, we had this M4 version under final test to be qualified for use. It's a titanium weapon. Uh, it sits here in a rig uh, because it wasn't qualified to be on somebody's shoulder yet. Um, and we took the breach here. That's the, the part here. And that you can see it's, it was 3D printed with uh, EBM took 72 hours in the machine. And we finished the um, most critical parts that need to uh, fit tight to the, to the barrel. And it, it, it's not even painted. You can see it sits right here. And we fired it because we wanted to test uh, a highly stressed part. And I'll show, I hope the video ver works here. Um, because we've, we had high speed cameras here filming in slow motion. Uh, if I, oops, that was too fast. <laughs> um, if I stop here, I can say, there we go. You can imagine uh, the stress here. Um, it's the pressure in like in a barrel a gun, of a gun. You have uh, close to 4,000 Kelvin in temperature and very extreme gas flow. And not all colleagues thought it would take the load, but it did. Uh, I have it on my desk. We fired three rounds and it worked just fine. And that was an important uh, milestone to show to my colleagues that it's for real, it's good material. What do you wanna use it for? And then the real questions could come up. What, what about the tensile strength and, and how do you heat treat it and so on? Um, this is the best example that we have from surveillance. It's an airborne co cooling system. Um, to the left, you see a cooling plate, and I have it actually here in my hand. You can see the size of it. It's only four millimeters thick, but it's hollow. So you have uh, high power electronics sitting on both sides, uh, generating a massive amount of heat. And you have a coolant running in, spreading in the plate, picking up the heat, and exits. 
Um, so and the on the chip here, you have a heat generation that equals the heat generation on the surface of the sun. So if if the cooling fails, it burns in milliseconds. So it's it's pretty critical that the cooling works. And now here we could be build this cooling plate in one piece. Uh, the original idea was to build it in, uh, in several pieces and brace them together. But there is always a risk that uh, it won't take the load and it starts to leak. This one is leak proof. Uh, we could reduce weight by some 30% or 50 actually. Um, and uh, you could uh, have nicer uh, uh, channels like uh, bent shapes like here and that reduce pressure, pressure loss. And you have, you can move the cooling closer to the heat sources, which improved the efficiency of the plate by up until 50%. And this was actually the, one of the two critical technologies for, this, uh, for the success of this system actually. And it's in volume production. And we have um, 400 of the plates and a hundred of the flow distributors uh, being produced today per year. And the flow distributor is also 3D printed. So um, that's a very good case where we have entered volume production. Um, and here's another one, a follow-up. It's a research project. Uh, it's also a cooling plate, uh, but we use topology optimization, which is an automatic technique to find the best design giving the boundary conditions. So let the computer do the carving in the, in the model. So we ended up here with a cooling plate where you have the, uh, here you have, here's the heat pickup zone or here. Um, it's all digital now, uh, the production manufacturing technology and the design and the uh, design in terms of um, heat transfer topology optimization. And what, what's interesting is that in this diagram without, saying much about the different curves, we're closing in on the theoretical limit of what a heat exchanger actually can deliver. Uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, I mentioned the AM demonstrator. Uh, we wanted to show what this technology can um, give us uh, if we start with AM from the beginning, because today we, take a look in an existing product and try to find a complex part and hey, let's 3D print that, that. And maybe it's a business case, maybe not. But if you start with AM from the beginning, you can see wonderful results. And this was my inspiration. It, it's a small turboprop engine from uh, GE where they set out to 3D print as much as possible. And uh, at the end of the day, 30% of the parts in this uh, uh, turboprop engine is now 3D printed. And the values of that is surprising. Starting to the bottom right, 855 parts could be consolidated into 12. That's a complete assembly line, goes away. 5% weight reduction, half the time for uh, the combustor chambers, that's the heart of this uh, piece of machinery. Um, could be reduced by 50%. And uh, since you can design the uh, fuel and air mixture better than ever before, you could lower fuel, uh, fuel emission, uh, fuel burn by 20%. I had a hard time believing that, so I had to call them. And uh, is that correct? Because two, 3% would have been good, but yeah, it was right, 20%. And uh, since the, the heart of this machine is, is in a better cooled now. You have 30% longer time between our uh, between service hall overhauls. So I wanted to put a sub product in the center here and say, what, what can we gain? And we did so. Uh, this was what we promised our managerial team. Uh, we have a case here. I cannot show the, uh, the, the product, but it's a very complex airborne system. It's an entire system. And we, we thought that we could save 40 parts to one, 50% weight, 50% cost, short lead time, and a very small uh, machine at the end of the day. Um, and we got the money to run this project. And after some months, we went back to the board and presented the results. And that was a 
nice day because we saved uh, 20, 75% weight, uh, over 60% cost. And bite to fly ratio, uh, th that means uh, if you start with eight kilograms of aluminum and you mill it and turn it and you end up, the product is one kilogram, the rest is waste. We went from actually 75 to one because one is with additive manufacturing, there is virtually no waste. You use the material that you actually build. Um, and the end product was uh, three and a half kilograms. We should have used over 200 kilograms aluminum to mill that out, but it's not possible to mill. And the size of the machine was actually also beaten. And, and this was uh, an extor extraordinary case. We printed the things and put it on the table before the board. And uh, it actually, the, the part of Saab that has built this um, got new ideas for products. Uh, so it affects their business plans. They see new opportunities with this te building technology. technology, technology. Um, I mentioned tools and fixtures, and here we work with polymers. And we had uh, early on a, a test of seven projects uh, to use. Instead of milling aluminum, you, you see um, a couple of examples to the right. Uh, it's, it's tools with uh, double curved surfaces where you, you actually bake uh, composite parts on these tools. Uh, that's, so it's a part of the uh, air, air frame structure. Uh, the goal was to reduce cost of lead time by 50%. But as you can see, we, uh, we got 80% reduction of lead time and 80% reduction of cost. So it's a no brainer stop mill aluminum, <laughs> um, just 3D print in, in polymer. So there you have the seven different cases where you can see uh, traditional versus uh, the AM. Uh, and that's an obvious value actually with polymers um, for tools and fixtures in our production. And uh, this is the last one. Uh, we actually, you can see here uh, the little patch on the aft body of the Gripen fighter here. It's, it's a hatch. Uh, it's printed in uh, nylon, in polymer, um, as um, an example of a battlefield damage repair concept. I mean, if Gripen goes out on a mission, you could have a container with uh, the printing capability inside, printers and all the equipment you need to produce temporary parts in the field to keep the emission going. I mean, with this hatch here, why is that interesting? Well, under the hatch, this hatch is uh, equipment that you have to access every now and then. Um, uh, the risk is actually when you take it off and put it on the ground next to you, if somebody steps on it or run it over, you don't have a hatch. So what do you do? Do you have take a hatch from another airplane, then you ground that one? Or if you have the capability, you can print it in hours and keep the mission going. So this was only the first uh, example of a battlefield damage repair concept. And uh, we were very thorough in, in saying, it's not the first time we're flying with additive manufactured parts because this airplane has half a dozen titanium components that uh, or 3D printed, but it was a first uh, exterior part and a first um, uh, temporary repair part. But mind you, we had to test it a lot before we got our airworthiness actually. And it was very uh, well recognized by the international community. Uh, a lot of interest. We, we didn't know what to make of this. I mean, are we good at this at Saab? We don't know really. Um, so, but the interest from the top journals of our business uh, proved that, yeah, what we have done is pretty interesting. And that was a good feedback for us. Um, and uh, we felt a little proud actually that they took so much notice about this little test at Saab. But, um, uh, and we made it public to show that Saab is working with uh, this technology because we also need to be an attractive uh, employer for the people of the future. Um, I'm a little over my time here. Um, I have a little video here. Uh, it, uh, it's an example of 
the potential creativity that this technology carries. And it's um, a dough knife, a dough knife. But take a look. Um, you can't imagine what you can do with this. It's from uh, Holland. Okay, there is no sound. Um, they have this dough knife. knife. Uh, you have to cut the dough before it goes into the oven. And the problem is that it's, it's bulky. It weighs almost a kilogram. It's 20 parts. Uh, and the, the dough sticks to the knife. So um, what do you do about that? Well, they turn to additive manufacturing and that, this is what intrigues me. They, they found a solution to the sticking problem. Uh, they have a new knife with a porous edge. So compressed air enters uh, at the end and it, it exits on the edge. And when you cut it, cut with it, nothing sticks to it. Ingenious, right? Um, and they saved, um, 90% weight, uh, all the parts became one. So the knife is integrated with the frame with the channel for compressed air. Uh, you see all these kinds of uh, gains with this technology. <laughs> and it's a freaking dough knife. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, the flexibility of the spring, which also delivers the compressed air, it's fascinating that this can be just one part, but here you go. And now as an example of the potential of this technology, when we and when I start to think about our complex products that we have at Saab, what might we not do with this technology when we get to it? When a lot of our uh, designers and engineers at Saab have, are familiar with this technology, Wow, what we can invent, I tell you. I, I can't see, I can't foresee what happens, what will happen, but uh, great things will happen. So I think that's a wonderful potential with this, this technology and we have only started. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jöran, for a really exciting presentation. Uh, I wrote in the chat, uh, earlier please if you have any questions we have time for questions um, write them down in the chat and while you think about your question I would like to start with one like you said you, you don't know what's next or, or the, the options are really there are a, bit, a lot of options in the future but what are the barriers you see right now for using this technique um, um, the know-how actually to get this knowledge in the organization. That's one, to, to get people familiar with this. Um, we both need re-educating our designers. We also need to fill with people from coming fresh from the university that has, they already have this in their DNA actually. That's the other way because it's, it's such a, it's a game changer. It's, um, it's actually a new way of thinking. Uh, and you don't train people easily to do that. So uh, education, and then you have to prove a lot of things with this technology. Um, a lot of distrust uh, behind building parts from powder. How can we trust the materials? So qualification of the process of the materials and so on. That's the other um, challenge that we have and need to overcome in order to find the nice applications. Thank you. There has come a question this here in the chat from Lika. Um, Saab is doing a great job with uh, AM. Any plans in adopting the production in-house and therefore controlling more the manufacturing process or will it remain as a service being bought? <sighs> You have no idea how hot that question is right now. <laughs> uh, we have touched upon this question uh, time and time again. And uh, usually Saab doesn't want to have production inside uh, its own facilities if we can avoid it. We, we have, um, I mean, Saab production lines are mainly assembly lines uh, where production takes place with suppliers all over the place. Uh, and so we have done up to, until now with additive manufacturing too. Uh, there might come a day when um, 
we have too much of smart solutions in a component uh, that we don't put it want to put it with a, a supplier. But we haven't come to that point yet. But I'll I see it coming because um, we um, all the time smarter design it becomes sensitive to to put it outside. But um, I believe that someday we will have some printing capability within Saab for maybe that reason, but uh, it's not urgent, not now. Great. Um, Christa Carlson's wonder, or right, it is impressing. Uh, has it been a challenge to achieve the same fundamental material properties for printed material compared to bulk material? No, not really. <laughs> uh, if it took the breach, um, uh, that I showed you the video where we fired the Carl Gustav weapon. Uh, and when it comes out uh, from the building chamber, it has the strength of uh, cast, for example. It could have been cast titanium, about the same strength. But you could uh, heat treat it and get um, uh, top of the line properties uh, compared to any other uh, technology, the bulk material. Um, that can be done. It depends on the application and what you need. So um, with the uh, uh, heat treatments after you can uh, get, get, get almost any uh, mechanical properties you want to have, like forged, for example, equal to forged material. Thank you for that answer. Um, a new question, how long does it typically take to get the air worthiness for a component? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's hard to say, but it's a very tedious process. For, for example, with a plastic hatch where I mentioned this, uh, we had to prove that the material mechanical properties were right. So we had to cut tensile bars out of a printed hatch and uh, test them in room temperature and to extreme low temperatures, minus you know, know what, uh, and to prove that the material properties were as promised. And then somebody came up with a question, hey, when we fly with this, it's uh, low pressure on the top of the surface of the airplane. Can you be sure that the, the hatch won't be ripped off? Uh, so we had to build a rig a suction rig where you had to pre put pressure on the hatch from one side and prove that, yeah, it can take the load. Mm -hmm. And it took us, I think, from the first idea when we scanned a part on the grip and plane, printed it, and just tested uh, to mount it on the airplane when it fit nicely, till the flight, it was close to three years, actually. Mm -hmm. wow. And a lot of paperwork to get the airworthiness and all the approvals. And the pilot need to sign off, and oh, all all parties involved. So it's a very cumbersome process. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, I know there are many people who are interesting in AM now listening, and you mentioned the Saab AM day. Is that an open event or is it Saab? -O? No, it's a Saab internal day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you have to be internal at Saab if you want to. Come. <laughs> <laughs> but you can join us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I know uh, that Joran can stay in the meeting for a while. So if you have any more questions and want to talk to Joran direct, you can stay in the meeting. Uh, so with that, I would like to say a big thank you to Joran for today's presentation. Thank you. And for you all listening. The next Tech Tuesday will be the 19th of October. It will also be a Tech Tuesday special together with Mark Saar. And here we'll have the possibility to either join physically at Ebbe Park or digital uh, at Zoom. There will be a registration link soon at our webpage. So I hope to see you then. Thank you very much for today and have a nice day.